Hi, I'm Ruth Werner, and this is my audiovisual sidebar to my article, Arthur Fibrosis, the Most Common Problem You've Never Heard About. Um, that will be published in the April-May 2023 edition of Massage and Body Work magazine. And I am thrilled to introduce you to my guest, Dr. Kaylee Usher. Dr. Usher, please, would you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your work? Hi, Ruth. Um, thanks very much for having me on your podcast. Um, yeah, I'm an honorary researcher at the University of Western Australia. Um, I have a special interest in arthrofibrosis. I have a background in immunology and microbiology, um, and I developed arthrofibrosis myself um, after a total knee replacement, um, which is one of the common causes of it. Um, the other one is ACL repairs. Um, and it was a bit of a journey of discovery for me because the word isn't out there in the community and no one knew what it was or how to treat it. So um, I decided to um, put together a review paper about it uh, in collaboration with some colleagues. Um, and following on from that, I decided to set up the International Arthrofibrosis Association again in collaboration with colleagues. Um, to help get the word out. <laughs> the, it was that review that you wrote that um, introduced me to your work, and then I later found the International Arthrofibrosis Association. Can you tell us a little bit about that organization? Um, really, it's uh, my intention was to bring evidence-based um, information to clinicians and to the public um, patients. I hate that word, patients. <laughs> We're people. <laughs> yeah. And um, just inform people about what this is and um, what causes it and what makes it worse, what makes it better, hopefully, um, and just bring some real information out there to the public and to clinicians as well because a lot of GPs, a lot of physiotherapists even, um, have never heard the word, or if they've heard it, they don't really know what it means. So, um, yeah. <laughs> is, is that what you mean when you say trying to inform your community? Is, uh, are we talking about GPs and physiotherapists, orthopedists? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Yeah, because the word's just not out there, um, and the, the knowledge about what it is isn't out there. Uh, it's often considered in purely mechanical terms um, and treated a bit like, you know, changing out parts in a car or something, <laughs> but it doesn't work like that, unfortunately. An analogy I use a lot when, we, you know, in the context of of human function, even, even musculoskeletal function. And I was intrigued that when I was um, starting my searches for arthrofibrosis that I, so that I could learn and share through the podcast and, and this article, um, one of my favorite resources for information, and, and I don't know that you use this or if it's a big factor in, in Australia, but I, I use a site called eMedicine, um, which is written mainly for, for healthcare professionals to talk to each other about their things. eMedicine doesn't list arthrofibrosis as a, as a topic, um, but I stumbled into an article about ACL repair where the author said, oh yeah, arthrofibrosis causes about 30% of failures or is a factor in about 30% of the failures. And um, I thought, well, why isn't, why aren't we talking about that as a, as a thing, right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, so that's I, a good yeah, question. Yeah. This, I, 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 I've sort of found it through side entrances rather than from people saying, here is an important topic that, you know, anybody who has a knee should probably know about or actually a shoulder or an elbow or an ankle yeah 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 absolutely I mean frozen shoulder is probably the most common thing that people are familiar with and frozen shoulder stiff elbow they're all arthrofibrosis um yeah. right <laughs> and I um I I'm, I'm I talk a little bit about frozen shoulder as an example of arthrofibrosis because there are people who would probably you know, push against that. It has some patterns that are quite different from what we see when arthrofibrosis arises elsewhere. But I'm going to leave that for some other people to explore with you, because um, I'm really hoping that Till and Whitney will will 
uh, explore that conversation with you in the thinking practitioner. Um, and because I have some other th- questions I want to ask you anyway. Excellent. So first of all, <laughs> I was really, really in- intrigued and inspired by your article, Pathological Mechanisms and Therapeutic Outlooks for Arthrofibrosis. It, that's the review that you mentioned a few minutes ago, right? And I will say to um, anybody who is watching this video, if you're at all interested in arthrofibrosis, this is an almost comprehensive overview of every question you could ever ask. It is, however, long and dense. And so don't think you're going to get there in a hurry. (laughs) And and I'd love to hear you you talk a little bit about what it was like to take on that project and how, you know, what it involved for you. For me as a scientist, it was fascinating. <laughs> I just love the detective work, finding out all these links, connecting it together, those aha moments, okay, this connects with that. Now I understand why that happens. Um, for me, that's really the joy of science. And mm-hmm. so it was a very long process because there are a lot of rabbit holes to go down to. Um, the body's incredibly complex and the immune system is you know, probably the most complex part of it. It's linked to every aspect of biology, um, you know, hormonal system, um, mental state, gut function, everything connects in. Um, So, yeah, for me, it was was a long process, but a very interesting one. And, yeah. (laughs) And the the team that worked with you on this project, are they also working with you on the IAA? Um, Some of them are, yes. Yorgos Mav. (laughs) <laughs> so yeah, I can't <laughs> pronounce his name. <laughs> uh-huh. It was a very, it was quite an international effort in any case. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it was, it was simply amazing. And, and, mm-hmm. you know, speaking as someone who has always been fascinated with connective tissue as a, as a thing and as a metaphor for how human bodies are. Um, I loved the through lines, for instance, looking at, um, uh, the connections between arthrofibrosis and other fibrotic diseases and disorders like pulmonary fibrosis or liver fibrosis or Dupuytren's contracture, um, because these are the sorts of things I get questions about, you know, all the time. And I love the fact that everything's connected through kind of mm-hmm. tissue. All right. So I have a specific question about arthrofibrosis, uh, you know, based out of your paper about the pathological mechanisms. And that is, you propose that possibly there are two types. Um, And and I will try to paraphrase, and and then you can correct me if I am misinterpreting this. But one type would be, would involve, you know, an acutely painful inflammation growing uh, uh, scar tissue developing and laying down stage. And then a, 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 another type would be a, a more stable, this is where it is stage. And maybe it'll get better, but maybe not. Um, and I, so in your paper, you propose these as two different things, but I'm wondering why we wouldn't just call them two different stages. Like in frozen shoulder, we talk about the freezing and the frozen stage. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. I guess, um, yeah, I am talking about stages, really. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, um, and, you know, in the papers, they like to say, you know, break it down into these obscure names, like it's um, arthrofibrosis type 1 or type 5, or and really I was just trying to bring something a little bit clearer to the <laughs> table and say, well, look, let's just simplify it and give it a name that everyone can say, yes, I know what that means. Um, it's either active and inflammatory and painful, um, which can be a permanent state, unfortunately, um, although that also goes through different phases within itself. Um, there can be, you know, obviously the acute phases immediately post-op or post-injury is highly inflammatory compared to the late stage, but it can still be active later on. Um, and for some lucky people it can go into the resolved phase where that inflammation is gone and you're really just left with that scar tissue that's highly interconnected and um, difficult to break down so you still have the restricted range of motion um, but you don't really have that um, inflammation and pain 
the debilitating, That's, potentially yeah, debilitating pain. Yeah, and, well, and, 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 yeah. and conceivably someone who, mm. who has achieved that level of progression where, where the inflammation has subsided could put themselves back into an acute phase yes. by re-injuring the affected joint or by pushing through the pain to get. Yes, you know, absolutely. A hundred percent. Um, and I actually did that myself, unfortunately. Um, I did have my inflammation resolve and had normal mobility for a period of maybe six weeks. Um, but unfortunately, I pushed myself back into the active phase and that's now permanent for me. And that's a very important message that I want to get across because those myofibroblasts don't go away for a long time. They're sitting there just waiting to be reactivated. So um for about a year after you need to be very very careful not to reactivate if you manage to get into that uh, resolve phase mm. that's such an important piece of information that i think a lot of people um including you know the specialists who should know better are not taking into account yes uh, yeah yeah that's so frustrating and yes. I'm sorry to hear about your own experience with this because chronic pain is, um, it's just a huge challenge to live with that. Yeah, 100%. It, um, arthrofibrosis destroys lives. There's no two ways about it. Yeah. And young yeah, lives. I was, <coughs> pardon me. And I was very yeah. intrigued um, in your, in the, again, in the paper, uh, you're linking the, the acute or inflammatory type or presentation of arthrofibrosis and complex regional pain syndrome, um, which is, you know, in, in my years of learning about pathologies has made it onto the short list of things I don't want. Yes. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's, and it's intriguing to me how much they have in common and how easy it would be to mistake one for the other. Well, actually, any tissue in the body can become fibrotic. And that's mm -hmm. something, again, that I think a lot of people don't fully appreciate. Um, and one of those tissues is nerves. Um, and yeah. yeah, surgery can cause nerve fibrosis, unfortunately. Right. Mm. right. Gosh. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to do something that, at least to American audiences, will be a little controversial. And I want you to <laughs> stay within your boundaries for what is comfortable. But I'd love for you, we're going to wrap up with this, to talk about why you feel arthrofibrosis is so seldom officially diagnosed or recognized um, within the, let's call it the orthopedic community or the musculoskeletal, the people who do musculoskeletal uh, care community. Sure. Yeah. Um, I guess surgeons, orthopedic surgeons are really the gatekeepers in a lot of respects and to some extent physiotherapists. Um, the orthopedic surgeons are obviously aware of it um, because it's a complication of surgery, unfortunately, sometimes. Um, but because it's a complication of surgery, I think some of them might feel blamed um, that they will, yeah, they will get the blame for it. And so they kind of, some of them don't like to talk about it. So <laughs> we don't, we don't talk about arthrofibrosis. <laughs> Um, and I think the physiotherapists, possibly um, the better educated ones, do know about it. But um, yes, and yeah, the other problem is it's just there's so many different names for it. Um, it's called stiff elbow, frozen shoulder, stiff knee, everything except arthrofibrosis. And okay, it's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, we can abbreviate the AF, but. Um, that can mean other things as That's well. That's right. That has so. some other connotations as well. So. <laughs> so I do wish there was an easier name for it, but I think we really just have to bite the bullet, so to speak, and call it arthrofibrosis where it is, wherever it is. And, yeah. Well, and, and you know, one of my concluding points when I talk about treatment in the column is that the more we learn about the activity of myofibroblasts and their interactions with pro-inflammatory cytokines, the more targets we have to suppress certain secretions or to block certain receptor sites, um, possibly to interfere with this, you know, early rather than after everything is all locked in. So, you know, even though nobody's 
talking about it, the future is actually looking kind of brighter than it has. Yeah, I agree. There's a lot of very interesting things out there that are in clinical trials. Um, one of the most interesting for me is um, relaxin, which is a normal natural hormone that's produced, for example, in pregnant women. Um, and it reduces those contractions um, and those adhesions that drive um, arthrofibrosis and fibrosis. Um, and those sort of feedback effects that keep fibrosis going can be blocked potentially. So I think that's one of the very interesting things that's in the wings at the moment. Wow. Everything <laughs> connects to everything else. Yes, yes. <laughs> Well, and that seems like a good place to bring this to a close. So once again, uh, Dr. Kaylee Usher, thank you so much for joining me. Um, you have a whole new group of fans uh, here in the U.S. who are trying to help people who have stiff joints that just don't seem to want to, you know, don't seem to get better. Um, because I believe there are things well within our capacity to be helpful for clients who are living thank with you. a challenge. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Ruth. <laughs> thank you.